So quick question for everyone. Who here has heard AI is going to change everything in the last week? Raise your hands. Now keep your hand up if you've also heard uh, a detailed explanation of how AI thinks differently than humans. We're surrounded by excitement about AI's potential, but we rarely dive into the nitty gritty of how it actually works and when it doesn't work. In this presentation, you'll learn how to identify where AI truly excels, learn to recognize its hidden pitfalls, and make informed decisions about AI in your use case. Um, so we'll start with playing a little game. Um, so what is this? Right, and shout out the answer when you have it. Yeah. Kim Kardashian, a person, right? And the AI can do this too. It recognizes this as a person with 88% confidence. Now, what is this? A cat, right? And this? What about this one? Yeah, upside down Kim Kardashian. So you say upside down Kim Kardashian, but the AI says it's actually coal, black coal. In fact, with nearly 80% confidence. Why were you able to get it right, but the AI didn't? Humans, it turns out, have a much richer representation of objects than the AI has. We have these invariabilities. For instance, position invariability. An object can be at a different position in the image and we still recognize the object. We have pose invariability. It can be at a different pose or angle and we still recognize it. That AI we just saw didn't have pose invariability because when we flipped the image upside down, it was no longer recognized by the AI. So AI does not understand as deeply as we do. It's not building those, these robust models of images that we have. It's easy for us humans to imagine a golfer swinging from the tee box without a golf club, but not for the AI. If you ask ChatGPT to create an image for this prompt, you get this extra floating golf club. And the problem is that AI learns off of correlations. So golfers and golf clubs are highly correlated. They often show up together in the tee box. And so the AI is picking up on this correlation and it's getting this wrong answer. Here's another one. I say, Dr. Mary stands to solve world hunger by giving her best friend Jane a call. Jane is certain she can solve world hunger if she gets the call. However, Mary and Jane bickered as children about butterflies. Mary will blank give Jane the call. So what do you think? Is world hunger something the AI should help us solve, right? The AI says no, not give her the call. Sorry, we bickered as children about butterflies. No solving world hunger today. And again, it's that problem of correlation. So the AI is picking up on this common pattern in how we use language. We'll often give a proposition, then say however, and give some argument for that, and then disagree with the original proposition. And so the AI is picking up on that pattern, and on that basis, it's deciding to give the answer of not. And in fact, the AI will answer in the same kind of way, almost regardless of the content. So I say helping others is good, however, spaghetti is not very tasty, Therefore, you should blank help others. And again, the AI says you should not help others. So again, the AI is picking up on these correlations, and they are sometimes wrong, and it leads the AI to reason in a very different way than we do. So I want you to take to heart that AI thinks differently than humans. You should not expect the strengths and weaknesses to be similar for humans as it is for AI. Now, that cat you all recognized earlier, the AI thought it was guacamole. And I'm fairly confident in saying that there was no one here that thought that image of a cat was guacamole. I'm 100% sure that there was no one who thought there was 19 different ways that that image looked just like guacamole. But the AI did. And in fact, Dan and his team at Stanford showed, showed that there are on average 19 different ways to change the image in a way that's imperceptible to humans, but that causes the AI to get it wrong. And you should care about this because that stop sign the AI thought it was a 45 mile per hour sign. Now imagine you're pulling up to an intersection and you see another car and you expect it to stop at the stop sign to accelerate forward. But instead of slowing down, it speeds up. There have been real lives lost due to misclassifications from the AI. And these are often mistakes that no human would make. There's Tesla's self-driving car thinking that the moon was a yellow light or people putting traffic cones on their cars to confuse Waymo vehicles. 
So given the bizarre nature of AI, how do we decide when are the good use cases and when are the bad use cases? So in our book, The AI Conundrum, we developed this risk framework, and it has these three axes which correspond to three basic questions you should ask when applying AI. So how much precision do you need in your use case? How strongly do you need rationale? So how much do you need to understand what the AI is doing? And how much do you control the input? So are you in an open or closed environment? So let's look at that precision component first. So precision is about how precise or accurate you need the AI to be to get a good response. So math and science are in that high precision category. If I ask you to multiply two numbers, there's exactly one correct answer and everything else is wrong. So you need absolute precision for math and science. In fact, ChatGPT struggles with even basic math. So here I ask it to multiply two numbers and the result is not the correct answer. So as you increase the amount of precision that the AI needs, the AI performs worse. On the other hand, it's great at tasks that require lower precision. So creative writing and image generation are two great use cases that require less precision. Here's an image of a dog with a plate of pizza. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can create an image from that prompt dog with a plate of pizza. If you're in this room earlier, you saw um, someone give a demo of the, almost this exact principle. Um, they asked people to imagine what a dog would look like, and they saw that there's lots of different ways people imagined it. So there's more leeway in the output you get. There's a lot less precision required. And actually, you can see just how much precision matters in your use case by picking that same category of image generation and picking a subcategory a sub that requires more precision. So let's say we're trying to generate the text in image. So there's lots of leeway in how you might imagine a dog, but there's a little bit less leeway in how you imagine different letters in the alphabet. So it requires more precision to create text than it does to create um, an image of a dog, for instance. And actually, if you've used uh, AI for image generation, you know that it struggled with generating text for a while. Maybe you see up there in the corner, it doesn't exactly get the word the right, and it's pretty easy for us to see when it makes that misspelling. Let's also talk about Zillow. Zillow lost $4 billion when they switched from being a media company to being a company that was using their AI to buy and flip homes. So the Z estimate estimates the price of homes, and they wanted to use this to try and flip homes. Uh, and we compute that they had an accuracy of about plus minus 7%, which is great for algorithms in this area. But you needed plus minus 2% to make this business model work. And they're operating in the most difficult octant of the risk framework. So it requires high precision. They need that plus minus 2% accuracy to make it work. They also have low input control. Zillow doesn't get to choose who buys and sells homes. Uh, if Zillow gives me an offer that undervalues my home, I'm just not gonna accept the offer. But if they are willing to overpay, then I'll gladly accept. So that's that problem of adverse selection. They're operating in an open environment, and so they had to deal with adverse selection. And lastly, there's a high need for rationale. There's a lot of ways that Zillow could have caught on to what was happening if they understood why the AI was making its decision. But it's hard to understand why AI does what it does. So they needed rationale, but they didn't have it, and so they weren't able to catch this earlier. Now, we see marketing as uh, in that ideal category of the risk framework. And so we've been doing some work in advertising and marketing. I'll pass on to Rex to talk about the exciting things we're doing in that category. Thanks, Caleb. So um, some of the work, this was Caleb's framework, by the way. And when I first saw him present it when he was in high school, I was sitting next to a Google executive who leaned over and said, you know, we're seeing the same problems at Google, but nobody is talking about it. And that was a moment that I thought, you mean, we need to turn his thesis paper into a book. And MIT was the first to receive it. And not only did they sign him up for this book, they signed him on to where they get to see anything he produces in advance of him publishing it to, in case they want to publish it as well. But this framework is a really big deal. A lot of professors looked at it and said, this was a really great way of thinking about it. Now, the good news for us in marketing is we are actually in the ideal use case as long as we have a human in the loop. When we go outside of having a human in the loop, it's like putting that stop sign out there uh, for anybody to add stickers to. And those stickers were strategically placed to hack it. That's why I asked the question about if you have a chatbot out there in the wild, it can be hacked. You can assess whether or not you have the risk. Uh, if you use it for internal documents, that's sort of perfect because a human is in the loop. You know who's using it. You know how they're using it. 
So that, that access of whether or not you have low input control or whether you have high input control is really important. Now in advertising, we have a lot of input control. We can look at our workflow. In fact, this is what you uh, heard uh, Karin from MLB and Greg talk about earlier in, this, in the, the uh, keynote session, which is that you can look at the workflow of how we build advertising, and you can say, you know, I'm going to focus on that, how we serve advertising, how we report on how we optimize it internally, and I'm going to use AI to try to help optim uh, optimize that. Over half of the budget is spent in communicating with consumers. Most of that's in paid media. So if we could double the conversion rate and maybe be more efficient and effective at it, that has a huge ROI impact. So um, this is what uh, Claritas is doing with their technology of one-hot encoding, uh, where they're looking at any data coming in, and they have unsupervised learning, and they're clustering uh, who should get what messages. Now, the way that that works, that, that's really this breakthrough, is your ability to break out the different parts of a message into features. And for the data scientists in the room, we know, you know what features mean. It's our ability to look at those differences in templates or in audience features, like what time of day you're accessing it, uh, what city you're accessing from. Uh, maybe if you have Claritas data on whether you're part of this uh, uh, segment or that segment, or weather data and so forth. So the AI is taking all that data in and it's looking for combinations that predict your KPI. Now, in Major League Baseball's case, that's selling a ticket. Uh, for Shell, it might be downloading an app. And we'll talk about both of those uh, really quickly. And we have the global CMO from Shell here, which is uh, great as well. So let's talk about MLB. There was that question before about AI getting overwhelmed by having too many versions. That's true. But the way that this AI does is it pulls it apart into what's called a hierarchical autopoietic automation. What that means simply is hierarchical, it first looks to try to understand which of these templates is most likely to appeal to you personally at this moment in time, based upon what device you're on, where you're logging in, et cetera. So it might be a player ad, a fan ad, a ballpark ad. Now we can extend that more by saying, okay, well what if we had different versions of which player we're going to show, or different versions of the player, different versions of the ballpark. Now we have nine different versions and the AI can begin to learn about images. And then as the AI learns about that, it can then also learn about different headlines. Now we're up to uh, 18 different versions. And now we can learn about different call to actions, like whether it's better to say learn more or buy now. Now we're up to 36 versions. And that's just for this one ad size. We can have this by four different ad sizes and there's transfer learning where the AI can learn across those different techniques. So that's what the AI is doing and this is what it produces. It produces a map and those different sizes of the circle is the different combinations of those different ads that the AI is solving for and they appeal to different kinds of people. And what's really fascinating about this is when you look at the Claritas data on what segment you're in, I happen to live in the uh, segment of Country Squires. Greg, I think, is probably Money and Brains or uh, Network Neighbors. There's you know, different neighborhoods that we live in. The AI is actually saying, well, overall, uh, the people in the country squires and winter circles are, uh, or young digerati, are 30 to 40% more likely to buy a ticket to Major League Baseball. But they respond to different messages. And so for one of them, it's going to be this fan ad, and for the other, it's going to be more of the player-oriented ad. So the AI is making that decision, and based upon the neighborhood that you live in, deciding what message to deliver including what uh, website you're on, and it might be a different answer if you're on an Android device versus a, uh, um, a uh, iOS device, or Verizon versus AT&T. So there's all these combinations happening simultaneously. This is just uh, one of them. So ultimately what we can see, how do we know if it works? We have a control group where we've randomized all the ads and messages, and we get to read how many um, tickets are sold to that control group where AI is turned off, and we're comparing it to when AI is turned on. And that's what uh, uh, Karin was saying about the 133% increase to 23% increase range or 65% overall. And we can look at that across all the different ads. We can also get insights into the black box of what the AI is doing by looking at how it's making different decisions by day and by neighborhood and by different group. And that makes us smarter as marketers. So I do think the AI is doing a lot on its own, but we get to benefit from learning from that AI. So this is a very exciting uh, use case. And uh, as Greg said, overall, it's been a 140% increase about what we've seen across these different brands that have tried this technology. We've tried a few of the other technologies that don't use as an advanced uh, algorithm, and we haven't seen Lyft. So we do think this is genuinely new and different in the marketplace. Let me give you another really quick uh, uh, case study uh, that was uh, shared recently uh, at the CEO CMO Summit. This is Shell Go. This is in the UK. Uh, where there's less data available, 
and it's the download of the app as a key goal. And they have three different themes. They have one that's a road trip, which is kind of a good idea because you're probably gonna need gas and food when you're on your road trip, or the app that can just uh, focus more on saving money, and then also the sponsorship with the Ferrari. Now this one kind of blew me away because when we saw this data, the AI, uh, in general, they all started with even rotation, and as soon as the AI learned enough, it began to say, well, the Ferrari ad is not leading a lot of people to download this app. It dropped it down to about 10%, a small segment of the people. But then it takes off that Ferrari ad. That's the start of Formula One season, and the AI was automatically detecting that people were more likely to become engaged with that message and download the app as, as a response. And then there was something that happened in the middle that we didn't expect. That driver ended up uh, in the hospital. And there was all this buzz online about what had happened to him. And the AI automatically detected that that actually showing ads with the Ferrari one were more likely to get people to download the app. But you had to change the word from download now to join now. And it was about that connection and that affiliation and that support uh, of that driver in some way. And so the AI is learning the, all these nuanced differences. And by the way, when that happened, there was over a 5x increases in people downloading the app and registering uh, to be part of the, that, that shell program. So these micro moments where AI can detect different patterns and respond to it and react to it in nuanced ways is what really makes, I think, this technology exciting in marketing. And it isn't a winner take all. This isn't an A-B split. This is the difference between looking at how all these different uh, versions of those ads with different headlines and different call to actions and so forth are distributed to add incremental lift and re, uh, conversions for Shell. So 200% increase is what they, what they shared at the CEO, CMO summit in terms of their overall business results, uh, pretty significant. And uh, I will now come to the last use case, which is all of that was a human in the loop deciding what ads to deliver. What if you use Gen AI at the front end to be able to change some of the messages? And that is what Remy Kent, the CMO of Progressive, did with this technology. We built some technology to allow her, to use, uh, her team to use Gen AI to create the scripts and then to create uh, um, synthetic voices and then to create uh, synthetic music, assemble that together. And they were able to create 96 different versions of the ad with one creative director when normally it would have taken them uh, many, many weeks just to create three ads. Um, actually, let, let's go ahead and uh, play one quick, uh, quick ad from that so you can hear that, and then I'll give you the call back. Want the perfect auto insurance? It's like crafting the ultimate playlist. Progressive provides customers the confidence to pick what's best for them. Whatever your life stage. Perfect, and maybe you'll play one other voice just so you can hear some of the differences. So there were different Want scripts. The perfect auto insurance? It's like crafting the ultimate playlist. Progressive perfect, that's provides... Great. There were different scripts, there were different voices, there were different music beds combined, and the AI was able to then learn which ones were most likely to lead to a, a uh, quote start and complete. So they increased their quote starts and completes by over 50%, and they had Gen AI at the front, make it more efficient with a human in the loop, and then uh, AI doing that same type of optimization you saw with Shell and Major League Baseball, optimizing the results after market. I want you to think about this, because the future is now, it is happening now, it's just unevenly distributed. You know, leaders like Carol and Karin are ahead of that game, and, uh, and I think it's a great time to catch up and get engaged. And if you're more interested in learning more about learning, I learn more every single time I do one of these studies. It's what gets me excited about being involved in business, and it's one of the case studies that we talk about in uh, part two of the book. If you haven't got a copy, there's a few more. Okay, um, let's go ahead and see, uh, see how, how people scored. Okay, so 88% of people fall in the room to grow category, and 10% um, are on the budding enthusiasts, and about 3% are rising star or above. That is not, uh, that's not surprising. That's usually where a lot of people in business start, and our goal is to level you up and to bring you up into that next category. If you're in the room to grow, to bring you into the budding enthusiast. Now, if you have a CS degree or, uh, or you've uh, worked in uh, AI for a while, you do, in fact, we do see people score in that 95 to 100, you know, 120 category, but they're usually people with that uh, an AI degree. Um, so I will pretty much guarantee you, if you go through all these days of these training, and you read part one of the book, you will move into that next category and maybe even uh, into that rising star category. Um, so thank you for spending the time with us. If you feel, by the way, that you've got um, 
people in your organization who maybe are overestimating how much they really know about AI because there might be more of this kind of superficial knowledge about AI from a policy standpoint, but not really understanding how it works, then feel free to share this link. Uh, so the reason why I think this is important is because when I worked on the last chapter of the book, uh, which Caleb and I co-authored, um, the safety issue became a really big deal in my mind as I began to think through the implications of some of the technologies and where we were going with the technologies and what, in fact, what was possible uh, that's possible right now today. And so we've got this area of TGA, uh, which is training, governance, and accountability. And it really comes out because we're moving into the era of uh, agent uh, AI. And AutoGPT was the first uh, agent AI that I that I worked with directly, and it came out on March 30th, 2023, so just a little over a year ago. And with AutoGPT, um, it could do uh, research. It could you know, had access to tools uh, like the internet. Um, it could it could actually also manage money and. Um, we, we've seen some AIs with the ability to hire people to complete tasks. So AI is becoming more and more connected and more and more capable. And specifically in, um, in for AutoGPT, you give it a, a mission, a goal, uh, and, uh, and it then pursues those goals. So in this case, I created one called Biography GPT, and its goal was to find biographical information for people I needed to introduce at a conference uh, to assemble that into a text file. And uh, and that might be some you know facts and and bio biographical background. I gave it Kay Vizan, who is uh, on uh, MMA's Global North American Media Data Board. Um, she and I have worked together before. I was going to introduce her. I was just curious to see how well it would work. Uh, she actually did in person training, so I wanted to see what type of information it would give uh, for her for a Kroger team, and it did a pretty good job. You know, it found her LinkedIn profile. Uh, it found her uh, bio on MMA's website. Uh, I found some other interesting information about uh, uh, her information from uh, Kroger and how long she'd worked there and so forth. And uh, and it, it aligned pretty well. Sometimes if you share a name with somebody, it didn't do so well. But, you know, the fact that all I had to do is press Y for yes, and it would go out and do all that information, gather all that information, assemble it, and come back a few minutes later with, with these key bullet points was, was pretty impressive. So while I was using uh, Biography GPT as one of the one of the use cases, the first week that Auto GPT was launched, uh, someone created something called Chaos GPT. Chaos GPT had a very different set of goals. Uh, it had the goal of being a destructive, power-hungry, manipulative AI uh, bent on the destruction of humanity. And you can read the goals that it had here to pursue. And again, all a person has to do is press Y, and it just goes off and tries to accomplish those goals for as many iterations as you let it uh, go, including, you know, continuous, which is what this person typed in. So uh, what could go wrong with uh, AI? Uh, and, bound, and, and, you know, the idea here, by the way, is called bounded agency. We're trying to give AI agency, but we're bind, we're, it's bounded within the... Within the um, parameters of what we set out for it to achieve. This is not a good um, mechanism to have complete control because some people's bounded agency might be fairly destructive as in this case. So the first thing that Chaos, GP, or Chaos GPT did was it went out and searching the internet looking for the most powerful bombs it could find. And it found one in Russia called the Tsar Bomba. Uh, it then created another AI to try to get uh, control of that bomb and to figure out how to get access to that bomb. Uh, some of the things that the AI does is it gives some counter reasoning of why it might uh, critique of why it might not be able to accomplish that goal and kind of weighs whether it's going to pursue that strategy or not. And the counter argument was that uh, OpenAI has guardrails and probably would not let it help it give it uh, access to the bomb. AutoGPT did not know about promptitis yet and how to hack that, so it, it decided, yeah, okay, we probably won't be successful on that strategy. Let's shut that down. Let's move on to our next strategy, the second most destructive thing that we could do to destroy humanity. Anyone want to guess in the chat uh, what, what it was? It opened a Twitter account. Hashtag Team Chaos. Um, so it did do a few uh, posts before the account was shut down, and it was trying to uh, attract people to its cause and for it to, to join. And given the diversity of humanity, you can imagine that some people did, in fact, sign up to follow. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was pretty just wild to see an AI um, 
last year beginning to pursue these these different uh, different courses of action. And there's been a lot of different things that uh, AI has also been able to pursue with this with this increasing agency that that raises some level of concern. So ultimately, I'd say I am an optimist in terms of how we can use AI and the the net benefit that we can get out of it. In fact, in the highlighted area is uh, me working with AI to summarize the main benefits of what AI can do for business and its improved customer experience, its increased sales revenue, reduced cost and improved efficiency and improved decision making. And I agree, I agree with all of those points that the AI it helps pull from its corpus of knowledge and information about where AI can be helpful. But we also need to implement training, governance and accountability. We need to raise the AI IQ of, uh, and I'm so glad that you're here to be part of that. And I hope that we can do that for a lot of other people as well. So we're excited about the book being in more people's hands and more people understanding how it really works so that we can make better decisions and use AI more responsibly. So with that, we will come back to uh, some you know, you know, tests of uh, AI, responsible AI use on Friday in our final session as well. So, and there's a whole chapter you know, section of it in the book as well. So now on to our second hands-on exercise, which back to the strengths of AI, and uh, we talked about how well AI can summarize. So what we're going to do is have you come back into the training here, and what you'll see is you'll see a login to Claude. Um, if Claude doesn't work for you, you can paste this into Gemini, uh, Meta, or, uh, or OpenAI. Uh, if you click this link, what it will give you is a transcript, and you can copy and paste it. And then you can go into Claude. And uh, actually, the first thing I'll do is you can give it the prompt. And each of you guys can just start doing this right now, and then I will demonstrate it in a minute just so that you can give it a try. But um, go ahead and give it the prompt, and then you, could, uh, you can ask uh, a question. This is our Q&A section, but the twist is that you're going to ask the AI with the transcript that I've just created the questions that, that you're interested in uh, asking. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate the exercise. Some of you are probably already doing it right now and seeing good output, but I'm going to go ahead and just do it so you can see uh, see how it works. I'll go ahead and grab the uh, prompt here, and I'll put that into Claude. And I'll hit Shift Enter, and then I will go to the transcript, copy that. And we'll hit send. Okay, and what you should be seeing now is a summary of uh, Claude going through day one and giving giving this summary. And yeah, I like the emphasis on need for training, governance, and accountability frameworks, and I'm overly optimistic. And uh, and you were directed to complete the exercises for the knowledge. That is pretty well uh, on point for what we've covered off so far today. And if you're asked some of the questions, uh, which hopefully you have done, you should be able to see um, you know, so how, I, how I would likely answer the questions. We will have some other time for, for Q&A, but uh, uh, for now, um, we'll ask a question, you know, according to transcript, why did Zillow fail? And... Um, And then you can see basically that the ability to interact with the uh, the information, the data, is not only does it have the data, but it has the ability to reason within it. And it goes through and talks about the lack of precision, operating in an open environment, adverse selection, and lack of uh, interoperability, and ineffective human oversight. All exactly you know points that I would have raised. Now that other prompt that I gave you, which was a little bit uh, uh, wider, which was um, related to coming, you know, asking uh, a question about, uh, you know, things like, is the stop signs problem solved? Uh, or based upon, you know, everything you know, you can tell it to either work inside the transcript, or you can tell it based upon this wider set of knowledge, is a problem saved? And what basically, Caleb's going to unpack more about how context works, and how things like uh, retrieval augmented generation work, and when when you 
you focus AI to use the specific set of information you have, like the transcript, or when you give it permission to go broader outside of that information, you know, how that works. You, you will see that unpacked on Thursday when we talk about vector databases. So uh, we're going to go to exercise three right now. And in exercise three, you will see um, the, uh, the ability to use AI to create your study guide for this training session. So yes, I could have created a study guide, but I wanted you to have hands-on experience in doing this. And so coming back to uh, the model of, uh, of choice here, um, you, you, Claude, Claude has a unique capability where you can uh, upload PDFs. Not all of the large language models have that. So if you don't have access to Claude, some countries uh, don't have access to it and some companies don't allow access to it. Uh, the key idea is that uh, some of these will take PDFs some of them won't. Some of them will be able to look at images. Some of them won't. Some of them have different kind of ranges of capabilities right now. But Claude is one of the better ones, especially the paid version of being able to take really large PDFs, summarize and analyze it. So we've done, unfortunately, the free version only lets us put about two days of training in at a time. But you can click the link and that will open up a PDF. You can then download the PDF and then uh, and then um, attach it in uh in Claude. So I'll go ahead and do that really quickly. And then uh, as we were suggesting with the prompt here, okay. And then I will attach that file. And I'll go ahead and send. And one of the things that happened here for me is that the message will exceed the limit length. A Claude varies how much limit you can uh, put in. So yesterday, this worked, you know, no problem. Uh, or it will work if you start a new message um, and, you know, try the same thing. So I'll start a new conversation. Um, we'll add that content again. And I'll give it the same text here. And uh, again, with that shorter context. So what you're you're seeing right now is called the context window. And it's how much information AI can take in or will allow you to take in to be able to analyze it. Uh, we'll be talking more about context windows and the significance uh, that they have in image generation and other areas tomorrow when we get into that section. But you can see that you could generate your study guide by giving it each of those different days. And we did give you the full transcript of everything we're covering off. Um, th that's one of the other links if you want to you know, look more at the, the, the detail. Or if you have the paid version, you want to give the full version uh, all together. And there's also a little uh, um, instruction on if you want to kind of hack these things to take in more information. There's something called chat splitter, which will break it up. And it basically tells the AI that's a, a document loader. And... Um, and that uh, basically allows you to uh, put in a lot more information than you normally would. So this is uh, this is sort of a, an interesting workaround. Um, so um, set this here so you can see it. So basically, what it's saying is it says, "Do not answer yet." This is just another part of the text I want to, uh, to send to you. Just to receive the data, acknowledge part one of six, then wait till the next prompt. And it basically tricks the AI into taking a lot larger context window. And so you can put in more information. So if you want to play around with some of these uh, afterwards with the transcripts or part of it, feel free to do so. Uh, the key point here is that you can do a phenomenal job with AI um, summarizing information. It can be a great instructor. You can ask it quiz questions and to develop quiz questions based upon the materials. And, uh, and um, I hope that you find that using AI from an AI training session for your study guide is beneficial. I am going to come down and wrap up uh, and talk about 
the, re the agenda for the rest of the week. So tomorrow, Caleb will be leading it, and he'll be talking about universal approximation and gradient descent in a very accessible way and show you what really makes something AI, how does it work. Uh, there's hands-on exercises and image generation, which I think are a lot of fun. And then also we're going to unlock some of the weaknesses of LLMs and why they sometimes get things wrong, like building on that idea of the however prompt earlier. On Wednesday, we're going to do a how large language models work. And this is really where you do prompt engineering and Caleb will be leading that session. And then Thursday, we'll be back to databases and multimodal. We'll be looking at things like how a computer vision and how that uh, works. Um, and then Friday will be autonomous AI workflows as well as a workshop on evaluating AI risk. So five hours together, four more to go together. If you read part one of the book, you'll get even more out of the training, but we will be covering the key concepts.